Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Kananga Banking Sector Outlook in for the long game or short game webinar brought to you by Kananga Investment Bank in collaboration with Bursa Malaysia and managed by Wellford. So today we are going to be explore to explore the banking sector outlook. All right. So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Shen Chu. I'm the moderator for this uh, session. Now, amid the hawkish macro environment, so we know that the uh, central banks are raising interest rate. So uh, banking sector will stand to benefit from this hawkish environment. So today we are going to look into the banking sector to see where are the opportunities within this uh, sector. All right. So um, before we proceed further, just let me tell you more about this uh, Kenanga Humankind project, which is a CSR project undertaken by Kenanga uh, Investment Bank. So uh, you may, uh, Kenanga is raising 50,000 ringgit for this uh, disabled empl employees at the cafes include. So you may, you may uh, support this course by scanning this QR code by pledging a meal at 20 ringgit only. So for every meal that you pledge, uh, Kenanga will match meal for meal, all right? So at least two person will not go hungry. And uh, this will sustain employment opportunities for the disabled employees who are working at the cafe includes, and it will provide training and development to these uh, disabled employees at the cafe includes. So for all the meals, right, it will be uh, distributed to the children in need. So just 20 ringgit if you are, you know, if you are feeling to help these disabled employees and also the children in need, you may scan the QR code on the uh, bottom right corner and it will take you to the uh, Gananga Humankind Project, right? Where Gananga will uh, match a meal for a meal, right? Just a little shout out for a CSR project done by Gananga Investment Bank. So disclaimer for this webinar is that uh, whatever we share in this session is only for educational purpose. So if you decide to make any investment decisions, you're 100% responsible for all your investment risk. All right, so today we are very fortunate to have invited Mr. Clement Chua, who is the Senior Equity Analyst for, from the Kananga Research to share with us about this topic in for the long game or short game for this uh, banking sector. So uh, without further ado, let me invite Mr. Clement. Clement, how are you? Yep. Hi, Shane. I'm good. Um, and thanks for having me in this session. All right. So I will just hand over the session to you. You may go ahead and share your screen. Right. Uh, yep. So hi, good evening, everyone. Just give me a second. All right. Um, so I'm here to really discuss uh, about the banking sector, as uh, Shane has pointed out. And why this title, In for the Long Game or Short Game? It's because, you know, now we're in this environment where the macros are very uncertain. Like, you know, we just got out of COVID. And right after COVID, um, we have this unfortunate uh, Russia and Ukraine conflict, which, you know, um, as we all know, is um, putting quite a number in terms of the uh, global supply chain and as well as uh, how commodity prices are affecting some of the economies. And, um, you know, un unfortunately, a lot of these macro um, conflicts uh, do translate to very material impacts to nations. And I think the first one we've seen to crumble is uh, Sri Lanka. Um, but we do not hope that this um, happens to Malaysia as well. Uh, we do think it's quite a long ways to go before we are in such a detrimental situation. Um, it is still something that we, uh, we have to be cautious about. Um, so, and to link this to today's topic, it's because when we look at the banks, um, typically we would see the banks as a more stable um, investment um, sector um, because, you know, they are hinged against the local economy. Um, they do, uh, they are essentially the backbone of the country because without money, without a place to keep our money, without a place to find um, loans and financing, um, there would not be any growth um, in within an economy itself. Um, and hence why I'm looking at the perspectives of um, how banks have been performing, if you were to position yourself in the short term or for in the long term, um, what kind of, um, you know, what, what kind of risk and rewards are we looking back, uh, by, you know, putting ourselves within the sector itself? 
Um, so just really briefly, the real um, key discussions here would um, be really just touching on these few things first. Uh, I would like to discuss uh, first and foremost, like where we are right now in terms of the banking sector. Um, and after that, um, a bit more, um, just to be a bit more technical into what are the key um, numbers or factors that we look at when considering the banks. And um, really the meat of it is the third point, uh, which is um, how the banks have been performing if we were to look um, on a short-term and a long-term perspective. Um, this is really where um, we duck through a bit further um, historically and see how well you would have been performing if you did um, um, put yourself in a certain strategies. And thereby after that, um, I would give um, a bit, a broad um, explanation as to why we have um, our calls and recommendations for the stocks within the sector itself. Um, right, so on to the first point. And I usually like to start with this um, really just to send the point um, back home as to why banks are really important within the um, equities market. It's because we all look at the KLCI index and you know the banks, five of them, the largest five, they are the leaders in terms of how we see the KLCI move uh, within the market itself. Uh, public Maybank, CMB, um, I'm sure we're all very familiar with those names. Uh, those are the top three um, in terms of um, size and uh, market cap as well. Um, Hong Leong and RHB, um, they are the smaller guy, uh, smaller banks out of the five, but uh, that's not to discredit their position within the sector itself. Um, the other three um, conventional banks would be Afin, uh, M Bank, and Alliance Bank. Uh, we also have two Islamic names, uh, which are MBSB and um, Bank Islam. Um, but yeah, um, essentially, you know, if we look at the KLCI for what it is, it is um, the accumulation of the top 30 um, companies within the Malaysian um, within the Malaysian listed scene, and um, it is typically used as the gauge to how we get the feel of the overall sentiment of the market. So. Um, yeah, that's it. We cannot uh, ignore banks. It is highly crucial um, in the investment community. Um, so really just to touch a bit on what has happened recently within the sector itself. Um, it's all because of COVID. Um, we did see a lot of uh, movement restrictions coming in, uh, phasing in and phasing out. Um, some of us may have been um, admitted because of COVID. Um, but ultimately, one of the biggest hurt, one of the biggest hits that we did see is because with movement controls coming in, um, a lot of economic activity was put on a standstill. Um, and this called for moratoriums to happen over the last uh, span of two years um, in line with the MCOs. And really what, what, the, what these are meant to do is that they're supposed to help to control um, the damage done um, to the cash flow of businesses and as well as uh, individuals when uh, COVID came in. Um, just as a sense that we do not want people to default just because they could not um, work or businesses could not operate. And so hence why we had these moratoriums and also some repayment assistance programs that we are still seeing ongoing right now. Um, and of course, when we look at this by nature, not having to meet your payments, of course, we would think that this is something that will be damaging to the banks because they, um, the cash flow uh, relief that we see from um, the personal point of view would you know, be have will have to be borne by the banks themselves, and so um, this is something that has really caused a uh, really um, has really shaking up uh, shaken up the banking sector uh, as of late. Um, hence, it's always uh, worth reminding as to why uh, we had to go through this over the last two years. Um, the first one was in 2020. Um, the second one was in uh, July 2021, and after that, uh, we are still seeing some repayment assistance programs uh, coming on recently. Uh, the most recent one is Urus, uh, the one that is uh, you can see on the right side of the screen. And um, this is something that is really exclusively for the B50s. Uh, um, because um, I think the government did also realize that um, this moratorium, um, some people are also abusing it. Like they do not need the cash flow relief, but they are applying for it as well. Uh, so this is something that's a bit more targeted. And uh, I would have to say, at least um, looking at the sector over the last um, the last year since it's been enforced that it has done some good to the people. And of course, when we talk about, about the banks, we talk about interest rates. Uh, this is the overnight policy rate by Bank Nagara. Um, and well, I think we can see from the headlines on, on the left and we've probably all been following it quite closely as well. 
Um, since COVID came in, we did come to the record low of 1.75% in the OPR uh, readings. And this uh, did stay for quite a while. Um, for those who have um, current um, commitments, I think we can see that uh, there was quite a bit of uh, savings that we did uh, incur on our end. But um, sad to say that um, the OPR does serve a bigger purpose, and that is to help us to cope with inflation. And um, because the lower the interest rates are, um, by, by default, that is supposed to help to spur the demand for more lending. And uh, with more lending, that is what's supposed to fuel the economic uh, recovery that we are supposed to be seeing at this moment. Uh, with, the, um, with the seizing of uh, MCOs and the reopening of borders. Um, but uh, interest rates are looking to come back. Um, we did see two hikes uh, over the last few uh, months itself. Um, sad to say that uh, we are expecting another two more. Um, that's our Kananga uh, expectations. Um, but still, um, although it, although you know we are not at the heydays anymore um, of low interest rates, um, I think some of us they, we still do miss the um, those um, times back in the day where fixed deposits actually do mean something. Um, I think right now probably we're looking at somewhere less than three percent. Um, probably a very small handful of products are uh, offering at that level, but uh, it's nothing that's very attractive at this moment. And um, this is also something that is um, causing some retailers to decide about uh, where they should put their money. Um, so it's a double-edged sword, but uh, we are expecting another two more um, hikes to come within this year itself. Um, of course, um, again, this is to curb inflation because we do not want um, a situation whereby the economy grows too quickly, um, but prices are also um, coming to a level that is a bit too difficult for um, the normal retailers to cope. And um, I think coming again to the point of Sri Lanka is that this is something that we've seen. I'm sorry, um, Cambodia, that's something that we've, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Sri Lanka, that's something that we have seen at this moment. And um, this is one of the key monetary tools that uh, we are um, looking at to keep the uh, economy in check. Um, something that is also of interest as of late, um, Bank Nagara did release uh, five digital banking license, um, although it's not something that would shake the industry right off the bat because uh, Bank Nagara did give the banks uh, five of these names or five of these consortiums, I should say, um, two years um, to build up um, to build up the backbone and infrastructure towards how they would um, launch themselves into the market. Um, I think for those who have been following the names, uh, we can see it right there. Um, Probably the ones that we are more familiar with would be Boost and RHB because uh, Boost is one of the largest uh, e-wallet companies within the country itself. Uh, RHB is also one of the big five banks. A bit lesser known would probably be the likes of um, C and YTL um, because they are predominant. C is um, pre predominantly still a Singaporean company. Um, GXS, um, it's actually Grab. Um, Grab X Singtel because um, they do have a digital banking license, but in Singapore. And um, they are looking to bring whatever they have learned in Singapore over to Malaysia. And this is supported by the Koch Brothers Group. Um, Eon Credit is also a name that probably some of you are more familiar with. Um, they are tied with uh, Eon Financial Service, uh, which is the uh, um, parent company in Japan. And also um, Money Lion. Um, this is a listed company in the US, um, but they are coming in to help um, facilitate the launch of the um, digital banking products and um, services that uh, the Aeon Group would uh, ultimately launch. Um, a bit of a surprise was CAF. Um, I think um, probably not many of us use CAF because they are fairly um, small in terms of the retail market. But I think we do have some level of exposure towards uh, CASM and what they do provide. Um, but and Jirnexu, probably nothing, it's not a very, uh, very familiar name, but uh, I think we can all um, it will all ring a bell if uh, I tell you Ringgit Plus, um, because that's really where the um, that's Genexus, um leading a website at this moment. Um, Money Match is also not too much of a big player, but ultimately this group of four is, uh, they are coming together um, to um, release uh, their own set of uh, digital banking propositions uh, going forward. Um, but um, again, this is not something that will happen so soon. Um, 2024 is when we will probably start to see um, all five of these banks go live at this moment. Um, but uh, the distinction between digital banks and the normal banks is that digital banks 
by its very nature, um, it's supposed to be non-physical, uh, meaning to say they have no zero branch operations. So everything you can do, you can do it over your laptop or over your phone. Um, and this is um, something that would um, help to make the industry a bit more lean in this in this sense, lah. Because uh, there is a lot of uh, mention that you know the banks are a bit more. There's is a bit crowded at this moment. Uh, we do need more efficiencies to come in. And uh, digital banks are supposed to be one of the more efficient um, structures uh, in terms of how do you um, facilitate financial services in this country. Mm. Clement, are you able to um, speak closer to the mic or speak louder a bit because there are feedback that you know cannot hear you very clearly? Okay, um, is this better now? Um, I, I think so. Can you? Is it better? Yep, hi. Okay, yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, so I'll dive into the next section, um, industry fundamentals. Um, so all the things that I have said, they do translate to something within the banking sector itself. And I will start by something that is a bit more relatable, which is the uh, GDP growth uh, um, that um, you know we usually track um, um, on a very macro basis. Um, okay. We do not have the June numbers as of yet. It will be released tomorrow. But the purpose of this chart is really to show that, you know, regardless of um, how well or how poorly the, the country has been performing, loans growth is almost a constant. And why this is so is because, um, coming to this slide, uh, also expanding on it, is that uh, you do see that when we look at loans, it comes in two sides, really. One is the business front and then one is the household front. Um, basically, meaning the uh, higher purchases as well as mortgages. Um, and uh, yeah, so even though businesses might not perform as well, um, we did see over the last year itself where the interest rates were low, um, household loans did pick up in quite a meaningful way. And um, I think um, probably a handful of you would have probably taken the opportunity to uh, um, uh, pump up or maybe acquire a bit a few new properties um, you know to put to your portfolio uh, just to ben enjoy the benefits of the low interest rate environment um, so that did um, translate um, or that did hold um, the sector quite well itself um, and of course you know now in this environment where the economy is um, supposed to pick up um, we do expect businesses to um, start um, demanding more financing um, even if it's not for the day-to-day -day working capital, um, we do expect a lot of the businesses that did not really do so well um, because of COVID to make a comeback. Uh, and this would really be the likes of your tourism sectors, your retail sectors. Um, I think we can also see that some malls are probably not fully occupied, and uh, but slowly they are coming back up. Um, food traffic is also um, quite um, heavy at this moment. Um, whether that's a good or bad thing, I think some people may argue differently. But the uh, fact of the matter is the economy is picking up again. And this is something that would be um, ultimately favorable to the banks. Now. And well, the point of this chart um, to highlight on the right side is that uh, although we only have um, June's, June 2022's numbers as of now, um, just really a simple estimate of um, thinking that we can see a flattish um, growth on a month-to-month -month basis, we can still see that the uh, loans growth um, or the industry levels uh, will hold up quite strongly at uh, the rate of um, between 5 to 6%. And um, probably this will give you some level of comfort as to where you know, the, the sustainability of your banks um, in terms of their um, top line would uh, be helped. Because uh, unless we do see um, loans come down on a very big way, then probably that's where we would um, have some worries about whether the banks are sustainable or not. But in this case, um, or even proven as to the this slide over here, um, the banks are quite um, well held. Um, they were not; they are not as badly exposed as like some of the manufacturing sectors who are a bit more sensitive towards um, macroeconomic developments. Uh, that which which might be a bit uh, unfavorable to some instances. Um, okay, moving on. Um, to touch on OPR, so it is the interest rates that the Bank Negara would uh, charge for the overnight lending between the banks. But what does that mean um, to the profitability of the banks? Um, so I think we all know that um, if you give, if you take a loan, um, you need to pay the bank interest. If you put in your deposits, the bank will pay you interest as well. Um, so the net of this would 
be uh, what we call the NIM, um, net interest margin between the banks. Um, and we can see from the dotted um, red line over here, um, that's where the OPR readings have been. And um, since we came down to the level of 1.75, we can also see that the uh, interest margins of the banks are creeping up, um, but plateauing closer towards the more recent periods. And the answer to this um, maybe is um, something that we as um, consumers of the banks are really not too happy about, but the fact of the matter is um, interest deposits did come down more quickly than the, the, than the interest uh, rates of our borrowing of, of our borrowings. Uh, um, and, but of course, um, to the banks, that is a net positive for them. <laughs> Hence why we see this stable um, um, trend in such a way. Um, but that's it, you know, um, looking on an investment standpoint, we do see that uh, there is a flattening of the interest margins. Um, and that's because, um, you know, having been sustained at such a level for such a long time, um, competition is um, due to arise. La, and that would mean um, banks charging more competitive loans, um, higher interest rates for deposits as well. So um, having to see an uh, increase in OPR would actually uh, help to break off this trend whereby uh, profitability will be a bit flattish for the banks going forward. Um, so um, I guess as of now, that shows that there are two good factors for the banks going forward. Um, nothing too much to worry about that I can see. Um, right, so another thing that uh, is also widely tracked if you want to compare the health of the financial system is um, the quality of your assets. Um, and I think as we all know, when you do borrow from the bank, um, sometimes there will be defaults um, and that is... Um, that is, um, of course, not good for the banks because they will not be able to recover their lendings. Um, but what we can see from this table right here is that, you know, um, following the thick red line, it did come from 7% um, back in January 2007. And sorry, 8%. And now at where we are right now in 2022, this level, um, the GL ratio, um, the gross and pet loans, we are at a level that's below 2%. And this is, some, this is a level that we have been since 2014 itself. Um, it's a curious case, um, but I would like to think that it's really thanks to our economic prosperity. Um, you know, having, having seen um, uh, our country being able to sustain economic growth for quite some time, um, in, income levels are rising um, and hence, um, you know, the risk of defaults are also diluted as well because of that. So a lot of the... So a lot of this really does show that, you know, Malaysia as a country, we are still not that bad. Um, we are developing, um, albeit not at a developed status yet. Um, but still, you know, this does give some level of assurance to show that, you know, as a country, um, you know, in terms of income per capita, not the highest, but at least we are still able to operate uh, in a very sustainable level and also in a level that shows improvements. Um, Right, but that's it, you know, although that's where we have been trending over the last um, decade or so, um, I think the more important readings would be where were we during the last two years itself, um, during COVID and during the MCO. Um, but I'm also happy to show that, you know, given the current levels itself, um, we are probably uh, erring towards the highest side of this band over here. Um, but I would have to say that this is still within what I would call a normal level. And of course, um, during the two moratoriums um, during this period of April to September and July to December, um, of course, you know, when you do not have to pay or when you do not have to facilitate your loans, um, it, it is a bit difficult to understand whether there is a, a higher risk of defaults or not, uh, because um, by the virtue of um, being able to not um, commit to your monthly payments, um, it's hard to say whether you are actually in a good financial health or not at this moment. Um, but looking at this, you know, even though um, during the months after the moratorium, um, we do see GL creep up a bit, but it's not a very exponential uh, move upwards. Um, so hence is what I would like to call still within the normal level. And, you know, we are now in the month of um, August. Um, the June readings are still relatively stable. Um, of course, it's um, coming up a bit because we are after, after all, just post moratorium. But still, um, it does give some sense of assurance that um, we are again, um, you know, operating in a fairly sustainable and healthy um, environment in the whole financial system. 
Okay, um, so now to touch on to this, um, my presentation here is a bit visual, but what I would like to show is some um, two different um, investment methods um, when we want to look at the banks. Um, it might be a bit simple, but I think it does give uh, a rough idea as to where um, you might be if you were to um, position yourselves in banks in a certain way. Um, I will start with this. Um, this is um, how the banks have been trending on a year-to-date basis from this year. Um, as we know, um, 2022 is probably the start of um, it's the start of um, our economic reopening. Um, but the highlight that I would like to show here is the the two dotted lines. We can see a black one and a red one. Um, the red one will be the KLCI, uh, which is our benchmark index. Um, the black one would be our um, Bursa Financial Index, which is uh, the accumulation of all financial stocks uh, within the Bursa Stock Exchange itself. Um, but what I want to show here is that, you know, relatively speaking, the banks are still holding up uh, better than the rest of the market, um, with the exception of um, two banks, which are CIMB and uh, Bank Islam. Um, but although we are seeing um, CIMB come, come back up a little bit uh, better um, over the more recent weeks or so. Um, and I think the explanation here is really quite simple. It's because um, we are in an environment where we are hoping for recovery. And when we look for recovery, um, we also want to see which um, sectors would be the more direct beneficiaries for it. And that, of course, um, comes to the banks itself. <clears throat> and um, although you know this does not really tell the whole picture as to all of the individual banks itself, but uh, Ultimately, you know, if you were to position um, selectively, um, it still shows that uh, irregardless, um, the banks are still viewed quite favorably amongst investors in the market. Um, and also, I guess, um, in terms of headwinds, they are not as badly affected by the commodity cycles, um, unlike manufacturing, um, oil and gas. And um, I think the worst of all would be the gloves. Um, but uh, yeah, we're not here to talk about the gloves. Uh, we're here to talk about the banks. <laughs> Right, um, so before I go to the wider scope of the um, investment strategies, just to highlight here, what are the, <clears throat> what are the biggest swings uh, or I guess what were the key um, instances in the past which did um, cause a massive shakeup in the market? Um, and I'm highlighting the big four over here, um, not really touching on the ones that did not last over a year, which is like the, um, I think there was a SARS out outbreak um, as well as the um, euro, uh, the euro um, default of Greece, um, that also did affect the that also did affect the stock markets. But uh, it did not really last throughout the year itself. Um, so I'm really highlighting the big four, which was the Asian financial crisis, um, the dot com bubble, the global financial crisis, and of course the more recent one would be um, the COVID um, pandemic. And I will start off with this, which is the um, the short game, um, as we would like to say. Um, it, there is a lot of numbers here, um, but I would like to highlight um, the ones that are green and in blue. So what this shows is basically if we were to buy the banks, um, any, um, any of these 10 banks for that matter, at the beginning of the year and held it until the end of the year, how well positioned would we be um, when we closed our position? Um, so really, maybe let's just take the first line, for example, um, KLCI from the beginning of the year until 5th of August, which was when I cut off uh, my data points, um, it did come to a negative 2.3. But at this moment, if we held on to Maybank, uh, we will see a 10% growth, um, public um, 13%. Uh, public also, um, I have to say that the bonus issue did help quite a lot as well. Um, it added a uh, fair bit of liquidity um, and also um, a lot of, um, I guess the cheapness uh, did but brings some renewed interest into the bank itself. Um, CIMB, um, as mentioned earlier, they are not one of the better performing ones, but uh, because they are still better performing than the KLCI, um, hence why it's uh, blue, um, but because it's a negative, hence why it's red. Um, so that's really an idea of what this table is trying to show. And to explain, um, how well you would have done if you had this strategy at the back of your head perpetually. Um, we can see right here that um, all of these banks, um, 
um, of the year of 1990 to um, 2021, um, Maybank, they did perform 59% um, or 19 out of uh, 32 times uh, better than the KLCA index. Um, same with public, um, same with um, CM, CMB is 50%. Um, this is Alliance Bank, um, 17, um, 53%. Um, and also coming towards a range of uh, average returns, which are, I, I guess they are all still better than the KLCI. Um, but um, coming back to this situation of the, um, the crises that we had, um, I think we can see here that, you know, although we are in a positive level for some of the banks, um, the KLCI did improve um, more meaningfully than some of the banks itself. Um, probably the one that is a bit more damaging would be the 1997 period uh, where the KLCA dropped by 50%, but unfortunately everyone else did drop more than 50%. Um, but really what I'm trying to show here is uh, in the end of the day, even if we are um, to play ourselves as short-term investors, um, just to enter the banks um, on a yearly basis and maybe uh, repositioning ourselves uh, as and when uh, the year rolls over, um, we are, more likely than not, um, still able to beat the index. Um, um, but of course, um, this big three names, because they are the leading banks, um, I think there is a stronger sense of confidence over here. Um, and Alliance Bank, um, it is a new favorite recently uh, because they did show the biggest recovery uh, amongst all of the uh, smaller banks, uh, which would be the likes of um, Afin and Bank, um, Bank Islam and MBSB. Um, so ultimately, you know, it doesn't seem like it's too bad of a strategy um, for the banks uh, to hold it on a yearly basis. Um, sorry, as in to um, enter in and um, take profit at the end of the year. But of course, you know, um, we are modeled by um, macro risk. It's not 100% guarantee that we will be um, able to um, come up with returns, but uh, it is quite the comforting statistics. Um, all right, so really this is just to visualize um, the chart um, above um, um, into a line chart um, sort of view. Um, it might be a bit hard to see, but um, it does show that, you know, when we do beat the index, we are significantly stronger than them most of the time. Um, this is to show the small cap itself, but the trends are really the same. Okay, um, so what about the long game? I'm holding it perpetually. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how many of us hold the banks indefinitely, but this table is this table will um, tell a different story. Um, <clears throat> so, if we were to hold um, the banks, um, uh, I guess um, not take profit ever. Um, the reading here will be a bit different. Um, so, as of today, would be fifth of August. Um, sorry, as of my cutoff date, fifth of August. Um, how much returns would we have gained if we had bought the bank um, or the stock since January, uh, 1st of January of each of the years? So um, this first line would be to say that if we held it um, since 1st of January, uh, Maybank would have given you a total returns of 10.7%. If we had held it since uh, 1st of January 20, sorry. Um, if we had held the banks uh, since 1st of January 2021, um, holding it for almost a good two years, um, that's 17.7%. Um, public would be about 20%. Um, 1st of January 2022 until today would be 23%, um, so on and so forth. So um, yeah, you get the gist of it. Um, but yeah, um, basically we see a lot of greens and a lot of blues over here. So um, probably by the looks of it, maybe holding the banks perpetually would be a sound strategy because irregardless of um, the swings within the market, uh, we do come out on top um, in the end of the day. And I'm not sure if any of us have been holding any of these counters since uh, 1990 um, without selling them. But uh, you know, the likes of Public Bank does give you about the 10,000% return. Um, it's not an overstatement, it did happen um, because there were a lot of, um, well, yeah, it, it just did happen. Um, and um, I guess anyone who has been holding public banks since um, 30 years ago would be extremely happy at this moment of their investments. But, um, you know, um, does that mean we should not start um, in the current period? Um, well, it's not to say that as well, because ultimately, you know, if we were to play this long game, um, what 
will be driving our returns is really dividends. And um, banks, they are known to be one of the better dividend payers uh, within the industry, um, within the stock market also. And you know, although we do come to the point where um, capital gains or share price movements will be something that will affect us um, emotionally, um, in the end of the day, if you were to keep this um, really just for a long-term investment purpose, uh, more likely than not, uh, we are still in a very comfortable position with our portfolio. Um, of course, this is not for all of the banks. Uh, these are the banks. Uh, I guess more of it would be applicable to the top five banks. Um, the smaller banks, of course, um, not as pretty as the top five. But it's not to say that, you know, if you did position yourself a bit strategically, like for example, our FinBank, um, you are able to gain the likes of like 300%. Of course, you know, it might not look so good over the horizon of um, 15 years or so. But to some people, that might be good enough because um, in the end of the day, I did triple my portfolio value. Um, Bank is as well. Um, but yeah, um, really this shows that, you know, Irregardless, uh, risk to reward is still there. Um, it's a matter of um, how aggressive we are in terms of managing our portfolio. Uh, but by the looks of it, you know, I think um, a lot of long-term investors for the banks are relatively happy with um, their investment decisions. Um, so just to show this in the chart form, um, like I did previously, um, mostly, yes, we are better than the banks, uh, sorry, better than KLCI. Um, but um, this one is X public bank because uh, to the point I mentioned earlier, uh, public bank would really skew this chart to a degree that is almost uh, incomprehensible. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, again, to the smaller banks, it's not a very clear signal, um, but still uh, there are opportunities uh, nonetheless. All right, um, so with that being said, um, having spoken about um, where the banking sector is right now and um, the findings of um, that study I showed, um, what does that mean for us? Um, I would start by saying that, you know, at this moment, Kananga, we are still very gung-ho with the banking sector. Um, although we did see some headwinds over the last few um, quarters itself, um, because when we did come to the period where um, the uh, moratorium and repayment assistance programs did come in, a lot of the banks, um, they, they are still concerned about asset quality. And what that means is that uh, there will be some provisions or allowance for impairments um, um, that will be re registered within the books. Um, and this is something that uh, is typically frowned upon because that means that you're holding unhealthy assets. Um, but you know it's something that's industry-wide um, and hence um, it's also seasonal because we do not expect COVID and this um, cycle of impairments to happen perpetually. Um, it's something that is a mitigative in nature. Um, we only see it because of the current pandemic, um, which we are really facing off at this moment. Um, so, so I think there is uh, more bright sparks for the banking sector uh, really at this moment. And uh, hence we do keep an overweight call on the sector. Uh, I will show you um, the general list of um, calls that we have for the stocks within our coverage. But uh, really just to highlight the points on why we are um, more keen about the sector would be uh, number one, um, we're in um, a situation of a better economic re uh, recovery. Um, so that will translate to better loans growth as I did show in the earlier slides uh, with the monthly readings. Um, and number two, you know, with OPR coming in um, at higher levels that will translate to better net interest gains um, for the banks uh, going forward. Um, and number three, um, this is something that is uh, a bit further in nature, um, whereby the <clears throat> whereby the um, right backs that we did see over the last uh, few quarters itself, uh, sorry, the provisions that we did see over the um, few quarters itself, um, there will be uh, eventual right backs from there, um, and hence that will be something that will translate uh, favorably to the uh, investors of um, yeah the banking stocks. Um, and also, I guess something that is a bit not spoken about yet, um, but trend, recall that this year is a year that we are seeing um, the one-off prosperity tax being imposed by the government. Um, and I think we all have very varying thoughts about um, what this prosperity tax entails, but uh, if we were to hold 
uh, a longer term view on the banks, um, you know, um, when we do come to a period without this prosperity tax in 2023, um, the earnings growth would be quite substantial. And I think I'm probably looking at the range of about 30% for some of the banks. If I'm not mistaken, that would be CIMB. Um, but irregardless, you know, it, it does show that uh, despite being one of the bigger sectors, uh, we can still look forward towards uh, growth um, going forward. Um, and, I, and for this third quarter itself, uh, we do have a, a certain strategy. Um, although, you know, it's something that I did highlight earlier, but I think it makes even more sense right now. It's because when we do look at the stock market and there's a lot of fluctuations going on um, because of all the macro factors um, that was also mentioned earlier, um, we do want to look for safety. Um, and with safety, what comes to mind is, of course, dividends. Um, whether we hold it just for the dividends and exit when, um, the, when the dust clears or whether do we want to keep it as, um, as an alternative to FDs. In the end of the day, I still think um, it's a sound strategy. Like, it will be something that we call a safe haven. Um, right. Um, so before I go on, on to our individual stocks, um, really just to give a sense as to how banks are valued at this moment, um, we do prefer to use the Gordon Growth model. Um, this is something that um, accounts for um, the efficiencies of the banks, which is the ROE, and as well as um, accounting for the book value of the banks as well. Because in the end of the day, uh, when we invest in a bank, we want to invest in uh, their book value or really at this moment is um, how much uh, of the loans they're able to um, sustain um, amidst um, netting off their deposits. Um, really, or, or in other words, um, just the net assets. Um, that really shows the value of the banks because they are a high uh, book um, uh, industry. Um, but uh, this is the common methodology that we would use for the sector. Um, some of you may be using it for your own internal purposes, but uh, this is something that is applied uh, for the banks itself. Um, and what I would like to show is uh, really at this moment, um, the top table would be um, a summary of uh, the fundamental, um, ex uh, sorry, our model expectations uh, for the banks. Um, but the highlight here would um, really be our calls, our target price, and as well as our calls um, for the sector. Um, we can see from here that we have eight buy calls uh, or outperform calls uh, out of 10. Um, and uh, we do have a, a market perform for public uh, and an underperform for MBSP. Um, public, although, you know, having showed that they are one of the better performers uh, at this moment, um, but at least looking on the near term uh, perspective, we do think there might be some limit towards the capital upside. Um, if anything, the longer term investors, of course, they would uh, be able to benefit from their dividends. But uh, for the nearer term investors, um, for those who are more capital upside savvy, um, probably other opportunities would exist in the other banks at this moment. Um, MBSB is our only sell call or underperform call. Um, um, I think um, for those who might have observed earlier, um, they are also one of the uh, not, um, not not so well performing stocks among the 10 in terms of uh, both the long-term and short-term study. Um, but really our, our, cave, our caveat for MBSB is that although they do see uh, a little bit more headwinds compared to the other banks, um, uh, let's just remember that they are also going through an exercise at this moment, which is to uh, assimilate uh, MIDF uh, into the bank itself. Um, we are still waiting for more announcements to come, um, clarity as to where this is gonna take the bank. Um, but that's something that would only happen, um, I believe it will be later this month, or if not um, up to October. Um, there, is a, there is a deadline that's been set by Bank Nagara. Um, but um, there is something to look forward to um, with MBSB. But um, fundamentally speaking, until uh, we are able to see um, the simulation of MIDF um, into MBSB, um, fundamentally speaking, I'm not too excited about the bank itself. Um, right, so... With all that said, um, <clears throat> we do have um, some topics for the sector. Um, I think the May Bank one does not come in a surprise because uh, it does show to be one of the outperformers uh, in both our studies. But uh, we do think that uh, May Bank uh, has a lot of value to offer. Um, I, th I think most of us are, um, in a way, a user of uh, May Bank um, 
in it, um, in, to some degree, um, whether is it as a borrower or sorry, as a as a depositor or as a borrower. Um, but in any case, I think the thesis is still fairly strong because uh, Maybank they are still the leader in terms of loans and deposits uh, in terms of the local uh, the market share amongst the ten banks uh, that are listed. And you know, despite them being the largest, um, they do have a very good sense of how they manage the asset quality. Um, the GL ratio that I did show earlier, um, they are um, still in a uh, level that's better than the industry. Um, and you know, this might come to a surprise that you know, um, the larger you are, probably the harder it is to control um, your operations, but that's really not the case of Maybank. Um, and that's really why I am I'm still quite gung-ho about it. Um, and probably towards the long-term investors of Maybank, um, can probably attest to it that uh, the dividends are quite handsome and uh, they are still expected to be. Um, seven to eight percent um, really does beat any FD products even in the past. And I do think it's a level that can hold at least in the next few years. Um, alternatively, we also like Alliance Bank, uh, ABMB. And for those who have been following the sector, you can see that you know, in terms of earnings readings, uh, they are one of the better performing um, small cap banks. And also, if we do come back to the angle of economic recovery, uh, which is an industry-wide team for the sector, um, they are the highest, um, they have the highest proportion of the SMEs uh, in their portfolio. And why this is important is because, um, well, coming back to the earlier point that some, some industries were badly affected by COVID, um, like the tourism sector, um, hospitality, some of the retails, and, you know, mostly they are still classified as SMEs. And um, if we are to expect that these industries were to make a comeback and then, um, and then some um, going on in the future, then ultimately we do need to identify who is the one that can ride this wave uh, stronger than others, and that would be uh, ABMB. Um, also, you know, fundamentally speaking, um, they are still, um, I guess more recently, um, one of the um, bright sparks um, in the industry because uh, ROE, return on equity of 10%, um, they are much better than um, some of the larger cap banks even. Um, and dividend yield of 6-7%, which is shy of me bank. Um, but of course, you know, um, some people may not think too highly of a small cap bank because uh, they are to some degree possibly a bit more risky. Uh, but for those who are um, probably a bit um, with a bigger risk appetite, uh, you might want to think of uh, ABNB as uh, something to look at um, going forward. Um, tactically speaking, we also do like often um, specifically for this quarter and next because um, for those who have been following the um, the headlines for Afin, uh, they are trying to uh, make their operations a bit more lean. Um, they have recently completed the disposal of their asset management arm, um, um, Afin Hon, um, or we like to call it AHAM. Um, there is no commitment by management as to how much they are going to um, give out as special dividends. But when the announcement does come, um, I think there will be quite a strong interest uh, um, given towards uh, Afin itself and what that would mean to the share price, I think it's anyone's guess, but uh, I would be quite uh, confident to say that uh, there would be a knee-jerk effect um, if there were any announcements to be made going forward. Um, AXA Afin, AXA Afin, um, their insurance arm, they are also trying to consult, they are also trying to, um, uh, I guess, uh, restructure it um, to be a bit more lean um, by moving it to a subsidiary to be an associate. Um, management is also quite confident that the net gain of it um, with their JV, if I'm um, generally insurance, uh, would be a net gain uh, for the bank as a whole, um, even though it's being reclassified as a subsidiary to an associate. Uh, but still, you know, um, again, coming to the point that we might be able to anticipate some uh, knee jerk effects uh, post the completion of its uh, restructuring. Um, but uh, yeah, um, all that being said, you know, it's not. Uh, we are still um, confident about the banks. Um, it, it does show a lot of opportunities uh, that we believe in. Um, and I think that, you know, ultimately in the end of the day, anything that would affect the stock market in the global, in, in a more macro way, will be something that will affect everybody. Um, and 
And of course, that is really just a call for us to be more prudent about um, how the landscape will evolve for going forward because you know there is no there is never any assurance as to what's going to happen tomorrow um, but at least you know i hope with this um, presentation uh, we do have an idea or at least some confidence on where to look at um, and also you know um, yeah um, hope this is uh, useful for your investment uh, strategies going forward um, thanks for your time uh, shane um, can i pass it back to you all right, thank you so much, Clement, for sharing with us the insights into the banking sector in Malaysia. So if you have any questions, ask our speaker today, Clement, please write them in the Q&A box, not the chat box here. Yeah? Now, Clement, we do know that your uh, webcam is frozen. Okay, would you want to turn off your webcam and restart it again? Because we can uh, no longer see you after you started talking about the recommendation and calls. <laughs> okay, give me a minute. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry, I'm not able to start myself back up again, uh, but I think you can hear me all right, right? Yeah, I can hear all right. Okay, okay. so um, back to your yeah. <laughs> webcam, right? Okay, no problem. All right, so if you have any questions for Clement, uh, do send them over at the Q&A. Um, the first question is by Maslan. Is there a reason why Bank Islam you know, performing fairly badly? Um, okay, um, I would have to say, okay, I guess this applies to um, MBSP as well. Um, there is nothing to say of the way they operate, but um, if we do look on a more um, macro basis, um, they, are, they are still the banks that are more exposed towards the lower income brackets. Um, and also not too heavy um, onto the higher interest uh, products um, within the industry itself. And also, you know, if we do look and in terms of an asset quality basis, um, they are not the healthiest. Um, maybe that is also partly to do with um, how they manage their assets. Um, but, um, you know, ultimately, all these things are really, a, uh, it's it's all accumulation of um, the the macros in the end of the day, like you know, they might be able to service the um, the lower income brackets a bit more efficiently. Maybe the confidence in them is a bit stronger in within those communities itself. Um, but you know, for for investors, and I also would like to think um, mainly institutions uh, because um, the uh, banks is one of the key sectors, right? Um, they would not, um, they would rather put um, their money towards uh, names that are a bit more resilient. Um, so, you know, again, it's not to say that uh, these banks are performing poorly as well, but there is more, um, there is stronger sentiment attached to the other banks uh, as to why they're not getting as much support. Um, but, uh, yeah, but also, again, fundamentally speaking, it's not to say that they're um, performing very poorly. Uh, it's just a matter of exposure and perception going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Jane would like to ask, why is MBSB at the bottom too? Um, bottom two, well, <laughs> um, in terms of stocks, uh, sorry, in terms of the price performance, I think I did mention earlier it's, as well. Um, but um, fundamentally speaking, um, I guess MBSB have, they probably have a bit more, um, they, they are looser in terms of uh, how they manage their assets. Um, and if you do look at um, between the banks, maybe I'll just show it right. Um, okay, I, I don't have it here, um, but uh, they do have the poorest asset quality readings uh, amongst the banks. Uh, um, and I also think that uh, that would be a cause, uh, that, that would be a reactionary cause for investors as well. When you do see that um, a bank is likely to um, face a risk of default, then um, you might not be too confident with that bank going forward. Okay, I understand that. Now, there seems to be some rumors uh, that there will be, you know, potential merger and acquisition among this uh, banking sector you know uh, what is what is your view in this area um <laughs> uh yeah we do get asked that a lot um, <laughs> i think yeah. consolidation will be healthy um definitely because um in the end of the day why do we want to consolidate is because uh, we want uh, more it's basically a way to weed off um, any of the more inefficient players uh, in the industry. Um, so um, maybe um, let's not look uh, 
on a bank-wide basis, let's look on a more divisional basis. I think recently, uh, one that has happened is um, Alliance Bank. Uh, they did dispose their stock stock bro uh, stock broking business uh, because um, it really did not do any good for the bank, um, really. Um, and they dispose it to a non-bank. Uh, I think it's Philip Capital, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, this is also um, a consolidation. Um, and it's a way to help the bank to become more efficient going forward. Um, on a larger perspective, you know, um, it might be a bit more nuanced because um, if we were to take the example that um, is usually the biggest suspect would be um, M-Bank and RHB Bank. Uh, this is something that's been spoken about for uh, many, many years now. Um, there will always be a cost when it comes to mergers, which um, the banks will also be very realistic about. Um, operationally speaking, um, you know, you will need to be able to sync um, the two businesses together. Um, in terms of branding as well, um, who would be the one that stands out? Uh, who would be the one that uh, gets weeded out? Um, and also in terms of uh, manpower duplication, you know, uh, that's something that's also not an easy thing to settle. Um, and it really does make the discussion of um, interbank merger very difficult. Um, so at this situation, uh, I mean, looking at this situation right now, I think the more recent one is uh, that came out recently is from Hong Kong Bank. Um, Tan Sri Kwek um, is looking to possibly uh, dispose um, his holdings, um, but it's a rumor. Um, I think it's all speculative. Um, nothing, nothing that is uh, too um, grounded on that as as of this moment. Um, but yeah, I, I think if there is any consolidation, it should really be on a more divisional basis, um, and. Of course, uh, if you want to look at the reactionary movements to share price, um, I think it would uh, be a net gain uh, for the two names that might be uh, involved in the discussion. Um, because one, they would, um, you know, have the gain of disposal from uh, from uh, yeah, letting go their non-efficient assets, and the acquiry would probably um, gain a bigger market share, which also uh, would be a positive uh, reaction towards their share price. But uh, yeah, uh, sorry, it's not really a straightforward answer, but I think this is how we can best uh, explain the situation here. So, so you mean in the merger between two banks, usually the uh, acquiry and the acquirer will see their share price uh, gain, um, uh, am I right? On a divisional basis, uh, I would say. I'm not, I mean, as in like, uh, maybe if um, one investment bank gets absorbed by another bank, um, but not as in the whole group per se. Mm. So what do you think is will be the impact of the potential divestment of the Hong Leong Bank's biggest shareholder? Um, I think it would be, <laughs> honestly, uh, I'm, I'm really not subscribed to the idea because um, Hong Leong Bank, they are one of the more efficient um, names in the market out there. Um, and if anything, I think uh, they should be the one acquiring people because um, I think if we look on uh, book value, um, and also in terms of valuations, they are one of the more expensive um, names out there. And if they, if another bank were to absorb Hong Leong's books, it would actually dilute their asset quality because it is that low, below 1%, I believe, um, where the industry is looking at about the 2%. Um, and also, you know, whether anyone is willing to pay the current price for Hong Leong, that's also another question because Hong Leong Bank, they are not the largest bank um, in the market. They are number four. Um, so... It, yeah, it's it's not really something that I can subscribe to at this moment. Um, yeah. All right. Um, the next question is: Why do the net interest margin of banks rise this uh despite the deposit rate also rises? Is it because the lending rate rises steeper than the deposit rate? Okay. Um. Yeah. I guess this is referring to my earlier chart. Um. Um. We have not really seen that happening. Um, as of this moment, uh, we would need to wait until um, we get the uh, third quarter results in November to really validate this point. But uh, in the past, when we do see the uh, OPR levels come down to the level of 1.75, the rates of deposits did drop down more aggressively than the rate of lending. Um, so that's why uh, we do see that, inc that, that increase in uh, interest margins for the banks. Uh. Um, and and uh, at this moment, you know, we're not really seeing much changes as to the lending rates, but the because, you know, interest rates are so low and, um, you know, banks, they are in the business of taking deposits and using the deposits to lend out. Um, so a lot of them, 
um, they are trying to take advantage of this uh, low interest rates uh, environment uh, before the rates do go up. Because when they do go up, uh, there will be some migration towards fixed deposits. Uh, and, and ultimately, you know, if they were to just wait until um, their customers uh, enter at the higher uh, fixed deposit uh, environment, then they will not really be that cost efficient. So hence why we're really seeing um, this trend whereby there's a bit of a flattening of the um, of the uh, interest margins uh, in the last few quarters. Uh. Um, but also coming back to the point that I mentioned earlier, because now we are seeing the OPR going up. Um, so the lending rate will go up um, probably more aggressive than the rate of the deposits as well. And even if they do sustain, um, you know, the, the difference between um, a 3% um, loan and a 2% deposit, uh, it's still sizable in the end of the day. Mm, okay, so you were saying that, you know, when the, the OPR dropped below uh, 1.75%, the deposit rate drops more aggressively than the lending rate. Am I right? Yep, that's uh, that's what, we, maybe let me just go back there. Um, that's, yeah, that's really what we've um, seen, observed in the market. And I guess this is a dynamic that would, that would not really repeat itself. Um, so that this, happened only once, is it? Um, that happens during this um, period, the third quarter of uh, 2020 um, going forward. But uh, yeah, coming towards the more recent periods over here, that's where we see uh, it's starting to flatten um, quite um, quite meaningfully. Um, you know, because when levels are normalized, that's where competition can be more prominent. Mm. So we expect that going forward when OPR is raised, then the, uh, the, uh, the, the net interest margin for the banks will also increase. Huh? Uh, yep, that will be, right. it will be two pronged, but basically um, lending rates will go up, but borrowing rates will also go up. Mm, but, the, but the landing rate will go up steeper. Huh? Um, that's hoping, yeah. <laughs> Not All for right. us, but for the banks. Okay, now uh, the next question is by Cheng Gu. Banks have not been paying out dividends during the pandemic in 2020. So how should we diversify the risk if we buy banking sectors for dividend income? Um, I think this comes back to whether you're taking a long-term view or a short-term view. Um, the I think the 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 not payment the not sorry the lack of dividend payments in 2020 I think it's also not uh, it's not industry wide um, probably the ones that did uh, escape the dividend payment was uh, M Bank if I can remember uh, but M Bank was a unique animal on its own because they did have to face that uh, one NDB global settlement issue of uh, two billion. Um, so that did impede their ability to pay dividends. But otherwise, most banks, they do pay dividends on a half yearly basis. Um, and, you know, coming um, coming again as to what is your strategy, because, um, you know, if you are to look on a long-term perspective, um, meaning to hold more than one year, if you do miss out the dividends on this year, at least you will still have the dividends for next year. Um, and, you know, structurally speaking, um, also shown in my tables earlier, um, there will be a high likelihood that the banks will outperform the index. Um, so even if there is, uh, even if you do miss out the dividends during that year itself, uh, more likely than not, if there's any macro recoveries, the banks will also see a uh, strong capital uh, gains uh, to make up for the lack of dividends. Um, but of course, you know, it's it's not it's a really it's this is really a blanket. Um, this is a, a blanket commentary. Um, different banks will, of course, have different exposures. Like, um, I guess to be a bit more nuanced, the uh, CIMB, you know, they do have um, Indonesia and Thailand as well. Uh, Maybank uh, also have Indonesia, but also a bit of Singapore. RHB also has Singapore as well. So um, on a more macro basis, um, these regional diversification would probably have um, uh, some impact as to how the market will react to the stock. Um, but at least on a broad basis, you know, um, there is still some level of um, comfort uh, that we can have. Okay, thank you, Clement. Um, what is your view on RHB? Uh? So this is a question by Chi Hien. Um, RHB, well, I guess um, we do, um, it's still a buy call for us, um, but it's not the highlight for this quarter at least. Um, but we have been, um, the commentary for RHB has usually been quite consistent. Um, it's a bank that we would invest for safety, but not dividend safety. It's more of a provisional safety because um, in terms of um, capital adequacies, they are one of the, they are the largest bank, uh, sorry, they are the bank with the largest um, capital um, safety um, amongst the peers in the market. Um, but what 
this means is that they basically have a lot of reserves that can be used for provisions uh, going forward. And that would not be something that would damage their PNL too badly. Um, but also having a lot of capital does mean that um, eventually they might consider using it to funnel into dividends, um, but that is um, not the tone that we've been getting from the bank at this moment. Um, so um, it's a bank that I would recommend to buy uh, probably back then when we were in COVID, if you are looking for a bit more safety. Um, but in terms of dividend payments, they are they are they are fair, um, I will, but they are not um, one that stands out um, that um, drastically in my books. So. Um, but of course, if you look on a longer term perspective, then um, it's it's still something worth looking at. And uh, you know, plus the uh, digital banking license with Boost, uh, you know, who's who's to say that uh, that will be the leader in the digital banking space going forward? Um, and if they are, um, I think a lot of people are more familiar with, with Boost, so the penetration will be stronger. Um, and maybe there will be also some positive reaction from there um, when they do launch their products. Uh. Um, so yeah, again, it comes back to um, how long of a view do you wish to put with this bank? Okay, thank you, Clement. Um, uh, Stephen Patrick would like to ask, you know, how come public bank is not in your top three picks? Is it because of its higher exposure to the housing loans? Right. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so this is back to the caveat that, that even though you know, public was uh, one of the better performing ones in the long-term and short-term strategy, um, but our recommendations are really more, more on the short-term perspective, um, actually within the one year itself. Um, public bank at this moment is what we would call fairly valued uh, at, at current levels. It, it is the only um, whole call out of the eight, um, sorry, out of the 10 stocks that we have. Um, and also because um, to the point of its high household um, um, housing loan uh, mix, um, I would think that maybe there is a bit of a uh, struggle to grow this segment uh, going forward because uh, with interest rates coming up. Um, but also, my main point here is that uh, they, are also, they are not really the best uh, dividend payers like, if you were to enter in this current level. Um, for those who did enter like you know, back in the, um, probably a couple of years back, um, you will be able to see better yields um, in, on, on your own personal portfolio. But for new entrants, uh, it's a bit... Uh, it's a bit unattractive compared to the other banks, uh, hence why it's a whole call for us. Okay, so um, in near term, not public bank, bank huh? So uh, for yes, no, no, yeah, not no, near term, not public bank. Yeah, yeah so in near term, not public bank. Um, so um, near term, probably uh, the next question is by help me is is main bank good for near short to near term. Um, I think it's really good for both at this moment um, because one thing that I believe is unaccounted for for Maybank is that, uh, you know, um, uh, really, really, I like to come back to the point that, you know, even though they are not, uh, even though they are, um, sorry, not the best uh, contributor in terms of their ROE, so not the industry leading, um, public and Hong Kong is the industry leading, um, but still, you know, um, if we do look on an operational basis, the fact that they are still the leader in market share, but still able to hold um, asset qualities that is better than industry average really does say something about the, how they are managed internally. Um, and also, you know, um, I guess one thing that people would say about Maybank is that it's very institutionalized. Um, but, you know, Maybank, they do have that dividend reinvestment scheme. So um, in, in, in one way or another, there will always be added liquidity to the bank. So there will not be, yeah, I, I guess basically there will not be a shortage of a potential interest uh, to buy into the bank. It will, it will always be accessible to the market. Mm, okay. Now, um, what is your comment on the grandfather rule of Bank Negara exempting bank, uh, public bank and Hong Kong bank limiting the shareholder stake uh, to 10% or less? This is a question by Francis Leong. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess, I guess what they're trying to do is that they want to try, they want to divest control, isn't it, in the end of the day. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I believe um, long-term investors, they do follow where the management goes. La. And um, if in the end of the day, if this is something that will cause the, if this is something that will cause the bank to um, change operationally speaking, then um, it's probably something that would also affect, um, it will affect the, 
the yeah how 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 shareholders uh, would um, behave uh, towards the bank itself. Uh. Um, whether is it good or bad, I think it's a bit soon to say. Um, but um, uh, I'm I'm more believed to I'm I'm more skewed towards the negative side now. Okay, thanks for your um I uh feedback. Now we know that uh, not just now we talk about digital banking, right? So the next question by Jane is now how will this affect the traditional banks' earnings and growth going forward? Right. Um. I guess one of the questions about this uh, that we do get is because you know digital banks they are new, and when you're a new player, how do you penetrate the market if not by pushing prices or so in this case um offering interest rates, uh, deposit interest rates that are potentially uh, much more aggressive than your traditional players, right? Um, so to that extent, I think that there will definitely be some degree of tightening in competition uh, because I guess personally for myself as well, um, if I do see uh, maybe boost RHB offer uh, FD rates of uh, maybe 5%, for example, I would definitely jump the gun and take it. But uh, they are limited by Bank Nagara's rule that you know you have uh, a, a cap towards your asset size. I believe it's three billion. Um, and what this means is that they can start with these products, but I do believe, like even for example, that five percent FD um, um, example, there will probably be a limit as to how many people and how much they can put within the bank itself, because you know in the end of the day. The purpose of this um, digital bank uh, is really to uh, increase the penetration on, in the underserved communities. Uh, um, underserved communities are those that are um, the micro SMEs and also those uh, retailers who need micro loans. Uh, um, and these, uh, these customers would probably be someone that will not be able to get uh, their loan application approved in the normal bank because their risk is just too high. And so to be able to balance this risk, you know, the banks themselves have to be able to find a middle ground between their uh, cost of sales, or in this case, their interest expenses, um, and as well as to how much premium they can charge these um, these uh, not so healthy accounts. Uh, um, so to this degree, I would not say it will be very out of hand. Um, it will definitely be there, but it will not be something that will shake the sector too aggressively. Um, yeah, but uh, in any case, I think we will all want to participate um, with the digital banks uh, because you know most of us we do have a e-wallet right so any integration with the e-wallet i think it's something that will be quite exciting to look forward to um but they will not I, I don't think they will come to the point that they will be as big as the traditional bank uh at least in the next like five years after they launch mm, okay thank you clement for sh uh, sharing your perspective now if we expect the economy is going into a recession uh, do you think that now is a good time to buy your top picks or you know, it is better to wait for the next recession to take place first? So this question is by Peter Chin. Right. Um, well, uh, we are aware of this as well. <laughs> so, but uh, I guess coming back to the strategies that I did present, you know, it's kind of, it's really 50-50 to some of the bigger banks, right? Um, so, but then, it again comes to the question of uh, whether do we actually end up in a recession or not? Because uh, if we do not end up in a recession, then there will be some missed opportunities. Um, so, so um, well, not to take this as direct uh, investment advice, but uh, I would probably um, not go all in, but I would like to at least uh, have a comfortable position that in case if uh, we, know, we do not uh, end up being in the bottom end of the economic cycle, uh, we are still able to um, benefit uh, a bit from the capital gains and dividends from here. But of course, you know, if the recession does come in, then um, most of the share prices would come off, uh, banks included. Um, then maybe then average down would be a good strategy as well. Um, but in any case, I think, um, you know, coming back also to this point, um, if we are looking on a longer term perspective also, yeah, like even here, the demand for loans will always exist, you know, regardless of uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of situation we're in. Um, and of course, you know it's it's not it's not just a simple um, it's not it's not as simple as just looking at one statistic and then taking that statistic and running with it as well because so there is a lot of moving parts in the end of the day. Um, but um, at least from what I can show, or at least you know what what is proven within this itself is that uh, ultimately it's a matter of probability, and the probabilities are still quite high uh, that you will be the net benefit um, if you do position with some of the banks. Okay, thank you, Clement. 
Uh, the next question is by Hai Chu. Now our ringgit may deteriorate uh, severely against other currencies in the future. So how will that affect our banking counters? And how do we hedge ourselves from this? Other uh, country currency may also de uh, depreciate too. Uh, so foreign share ownership is also risky then. Right. Um, yeah, this is um, also one of the, um, I guess, uh, more macro elements that is a bit worrying for us at this moment. Um, but um, I guess fundamentally speaking, we need to look again as to what is the net impact of uh, Forex towards our economy. Um, of course, uh, we are uh, we we do imports as well. But you know, if you do look on a, on a more national basis, uh, I I I do believe we are maybe net exporters because we do have a lot of uh, manufacturing um, arms as well as um, the tech uh, you know the those um, tech manufacturers um, in the country itself. And uh, these industries are going to benefit from the higher um, forex rates. Um, of course, you know, if you look on the commodities perspectives, so maybe on the more local, um, I, I guess for the likes of those um, who are net importers, like uh, your poultry segments, um, there will there will definitely be some damage going forward. Um, but you know, those are not solely affected by forex also you know those have their own commodity cycles so in that sense it's a little bit hard to pinpoint um which exactly would be the ones that would uh, detriment will be more damaging towards the overall sector um but you know in the end of the day if you want to look at it um the banks they are not only exposed to one certain industry they are exposed to the whole basket of the economy itself um, and actually, uh, well, I do not have it here, but uh, most banks, they are, uh, they do have a 50-50 mix. 50-50 um, meaning a 50-50 business and 50-50 household. And I think this really is it's also translated here. Uh, yeah, it's also translated here to some degree. Um, we are not purely dependent on business loans. Um, and, you know, the household loans is also really coming from our local, uh, our local retailers in, in this extent. Um, so, um, of course, we do want the economy to benefit, but uh, in the end of the day, uh, it's not just one single sector that the making sector is uh, is uh, dependent on. It's the whole economy, um, and I think in this, at least in this uh, environment, inflation would be net inflation would be the biggest concern uh, as opposed to uh, just the local. Um, sorry, the our forex uh, rates uh, on the global level. Mm, all right. Thank you so much, uh, Clement. The next question is by Jane. Uh, how about other financial counters such as, you know, Aeon Credit, Eldesa, are they doing much better than the local banks? And uh, what will be the risk for the growth in the future? Right. Um, well, sorry, but I don't cover ELK this, uh, but I do cover Aeon Credit. Um, but what I can say is that um, generally they will still be beneficiaries of uh, the economy opening. Um, I guess Aeon Credit on a, on to some degree they are not as focused on businesses like um, like the banks are. Um, they are more retail driven. Uh, I believe their mix is more of uh, motorcycle, personal financing and also um, um, and uh, also maybe credit cards to some degree. Um, and you know taking that note, when we come to the when we come to the discussion of uh, economic reopening, this also means there will be higher retail spending. And when there's higher retail spending, there will be higher appetite for debt. And that's also something that we are seeing, um, you know, in this table itself, um, you know, household loans are still coming up. Um, it's not just fueled by property purchases, it's also, high, it's also higher purchases uh, and personal loans itself. So um, I guess what this means is that, you know, we are still healthy. Um, there is, I, I guess the term that people like to use is re revenge spending. Like, you know, we have not really spent so much during the COVID itself. So now we have, uh, we have flush with Cash and I know we're trying to spend it. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, we still see quite healthy um, demand for financing. Um, and I think it's something that will continue at least for the next few quarters. Uh. Um, of course, um, I think the number one kicker would be if COVID does come back again, um, um, which I think it might be unlikely, um, but that is the one thing that would stop uh, the sector um, almost immediately. Um, yeah. And but that again, that would affect all sectors uh, and every stock in the every stocks in the market. Yeah, especially the loan moratorium, which is pretty damaging to the sector. 
exactly. The next question is by Ting Yi. Now, how do you classify banks? Yeah? Do you see them as a cyclical counters or do you see them as a growth stocks? So uh, I think he left a remark that, you know, he felt that public bank and Hong Leong Bank should fall under growth stocks. Is there any explanation for that? Um, okay, well, I guess this comes down to how we value the banks, right? Um, Hong Kong Bank is still a buy call for us, actually. Um, and we are still, uh, we, we, we still do like the name. Um, but the but again, we come back to our investment strategy for this quarter itself, because um, I believe that the highlight at this moment is still really um, on where we are on a more macro level, right? Because the Russia-Ukraine conflict has not ended yet. Um, commodities are still a bit out of control and uh, you know in the end of the day even I mean even though right now we are still seeing some some um, small recovery um, in the overall index uh, and the overall stock exchange um, but there is still some risk um, as to how badly things can turn if um, something else were to come into the picture um, so yeah so um, right now it's not there is no discrimination as to the long-term view of the other banks uh, it's just that the positioning, uh, at least in this moment, uh, I'm more fav I'm more skewed towards uh, the names here. Um, public bank, um, I think, also alluding to the earlier point, is that it's not to say that it will not be a strong performer in the long term, but at least in the near term, we do think it's fairly valued given the current fundamentals that we're looking at for the banks. Okay, thank you, Clement. Um, how do you evaluate the value of banks? Uh? And how should a retailer like us, you know, evaluate banks? Um, well, I do like to share this. <laughs> yeah, you it's, use it's, a Gordon growth model, right? Yeah, it's it's very technical. Um, but in the end of the day, we look at the book value of the banks because um it all comes down to how big or how much of a market share the banks have and how efficiently they do use the uh, what uh, what assets that they have. Um, that, hence why we have the component of um, book value per share as well as ROE going forward. Of course, we do have a growth component as well. But um, if we do take um, this Gordon growth measure of a cost of equity, um, why this is here is really because we, we take the banks uh, as a very uh, big proxy towards the overall economy and to some degree the stock exchange. Right. So this cost of equity component is a device that we have um, at, it, if we want to compare the banking sector across other sectors as well. So um, hence why this um, Gordon Growth uh, method is um, quite favoured amongst the banking space. Um, it's quite technical, um, but for us analysts in the end of the day, we do want something that is a bit more fundamental when it comes to evaluating our stocks. Uh, so for the banks, we do come back to book value per share. And, um, and I think one, one question I do get um, sometimes is that why some of the banks, uh, they are below one-time book value. Um, um, I mean, that's just how valuation works, right? Um, because in the end of the day, it's not its not to say that if you do invest in CIB, for example, you will get exactly um, the same value as to one-time book, book value for CIMB. Um, in the end of the day, it's, it's also going to be other moving parts as well. Um, they might not be as efficient as the other banks. Uh, they also might have some troubles with their cost management. Um, I mean, just generally speaking. But uh, what we do see is that, you know, the valuations do, um, to some degree, have a bit of an academic aspect to it, and hence why uh, it's uh, it's the method that we do use going forward. Mm, do you feel that for banks, any for any banks that uh, who has their price to book value uh, below one would mean that it is a good bargain? Uh, yeah, so uh, like I just said, uh, not exactly uh, because it's not it's not to say like um, um, I guess uh, Afin Bank if it's uh, if the book value is eight ringgit that means if you invest in the bank you get eight ringgit back you know it, it doesn't work like that um, and I think the argument also works for the net if you want to look on a net cash per share basis. I, I know there are some counters that they are maybe like 18 cents and it's like 20 cents net cash per share. Um, of course, it does seem like uh, as an investor, we are getting good value out of it, but um, it does not mean that that's, that is the value that is going to end up in our pockets. Um, in the end, um, it's all about sentiment um, and the sentiment does not reflect that the stock is worth um, one-time book value. Um, so it's not as simple as uh, making decisions based on that. 
That's uh, what I can say. Okay, so essentially, is a uh, price to book value a better metric uh, in comparison to PE? For the banks, it will be uh, because um, PE is something that uh, we do use for, um, for I guess companies that, are, <coughs> excuse me. PE would be more favored towards companies that uh, could probably show very exponential um, earnings growth going forward. I think this is more picked towards like the likes of manufacturing. Um, because for manufacturers, we do try to look at um, how fast they can grow their businesses. And um, to that nature, that also ascribes to how much um, how much uh, PE we can give towards the growth that we're looking at. Um, but for banks, what we are growing is really your... Um, what, what, what we start to grow at the first place would be your loans books anyway. So, uh, but it doesn't mean that you grow your loans books by 10%. That means you have an earnings increase of 10% as well. Uh, there are a lot of factors that comes into play that would affect how, um, how efficiently uh, you get to churn out the, this 10% uh, growth in loans towards your bottom line, uh, right? So, uh, hence why it's not as simple uh, as using PE. Um, but we are able to draw some historical trends as to how to measure PE amongst the banks. But it's just that, you know, given the academics that we have on the sector, uh, it, it, it is a bit more sound to use price to book, at least in my opinion. Right. So that's um, what we retail investors should uh, remember. <laughs> okay, PV will be a better matrix uh, in terms of eval uh, evaluation of a bank. For the long-term performance of banks, right, how do you factor in the dividend payouts? So this question is by Yip. Right. Um, so I guess this is where um, having a long-term coverage also helps as well. Because what we can say is that um, even though, I, I guess the example that I like to use and also the example that uh, gets questioned a lot is that uh, Maybank, you know, management has always been saying that they will only pay 60% of their earnings. But if you do the calculations historically, they in fact have always been paying 80% and they have never not paid below 80%. <laughs> so, you know, the confidence is really there uh, to expect the same going forward. Um, and that's, uh, that's a conclusion that we can draw when we look at the numbers historically speaking. Um, of course, you know, there might be some blip years amongst the banks. Um, um, for example, like uh, M-Bank, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but you know that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that uh, there will be a new norm because of this uh, one-off uh, instance, right? Um, because um, um, it, it is a one-off. Um, coming back to that point, and you know, Maybank um, hosts to say that uh, they might be. I mean, touch wood, uh, slap with a fine like that as well. Uh, maybe then there will be an exclusion. But of course, we do expect uh, a normal rate to come back uh, in the subsequent periods. Hence, why. Uh, we do um, we we have this um we we do have this assurance that uh, historically speaking, there is some level of su sustainability in terms of the dividend payments. All right, so I think uh, that shall conclude our question and answer with Clement. So thank you so much, Clement, for sharing with us the insights into the uh, banking sector outlook. I think we all have gained enormous value from this session. So thank you, Clement. Thanks, Shane. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. All right. So for our next webinar, uh, for our next Can Trade webinar, it is titled Basics of Day Trading 101. How to day trade the market profitably. Okay, so that will happen on the 8th of uh, September, 2022. It's a Thursday. So the time is from 8.30 to 9.45. So if you want to register for this uh, session, you may go ahead and... Uh, now register at the link that I have just given you in the chat box. All right. So uh, it's happening on 8th of September, Basics of Day Trading 101, where we are going to go through the essentials of day trading uh, skills. And then what are some strategies we can use to day trade the market profitably as a living. Uh, if you still haven't had a, a Kananga share trading account, you may fill up this online form at www cantrade.com.my forward slash open dash account dash form. Uh, that's where you can put in your interest to open an account with Kananga uh, and then Kananga will arrange a friendly dealer representative to cater to your needs to open a trading account. And if you are looking for some trading ideas, you know, to trade the market, then you may join the Kananga Trade to Win Telegram channel where 
uh, you will get a lot of trading ideas on uh, what stocks to buy, what is the TP, what is the stop loss. You know, you can get a lot of trading ideas from Kunanga Trade to Win Telegram channel. So remember to subscribe to that. So with that, I would like to thank all of you here for spending your precious time with us this evening on this uh, Can Trade webinar. So hope to see you all in our next Can Trade webinar on the 8th of September. Uh, bye, everyone. Yes, Alvin is asking, can Kananga trade overseas shares? The answer is yes, definitely. All right. So if you can reach out to uh, uh, Kananga dealers, then they will guide you on how you can trade uh, overseas shares, all right, foreign shares.